last night, my wife and I are watching a little TV, relaxing a little bit, and um, you, you, you might draw a conclusion about me just based on the kind of TV show that I'm going to tell you about, but I, I was watching Cops last night. A anybody here? Any Cops watchers? Okay, I'm watching Cops. Um, it was really interesting last night as I'm watching Cops. Uh, the, police, the police are called to this house where there's been an alter altercation. I, I don't even know if that's the right word, but I'm using it, and so it's my word right now, and it's right. And it, it involved several individuals, two of which were ladies, and they got into a big fight. One of them was fighting with a broom, and the other one had a knife. <laughs> okay, that's just kind of the way the whole fight went. What I found interesting about the thing is that the woman who was charged with wielding the knife and trying to stab the other girl, she wore a necklace with a cross on it. So I'm sitting, I'm the pastor going, I wonder if anybody at Life Church wields a knife while they wear a cross, you know? And I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. Why is she wearing a cross? What significance? I mean, is it just decorative to her or does it have some spiritual significance to her? If I was to interview her, if I could call her, find out where she was, and I said, are you a Christ follower? I, I wonder if she'd say, yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. And I think, I think today is, 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 is culture looks at Christianity. As culture looks at Christianity, I wonder if there's some confusion about what it is to be a Christian. Because I think Christians are confused about what it is to be a Christian. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when we launched this whole series, we, we, we talked about... Um, kind of our life with Christ, kind of this up and down life that we lead. And I put it in a diagram, and I'll show you the diagram here this morning. It looks something like this, um, that when, when, when we're walking through life before we come to Jesus, um, at some point in our life, we, we feel like we're below this line. If I can put that diagram up here, that'd be great. We, we feel like our life is below this line. We haven't yet started serving Jesus. Apparently, we're having technical issues because I see our director leaving. So anyway, we, we, we've got this line. We've got this line. And this is where it is to walk with Jesus. There it is. Thank you so much. There's where it is to walk with Jesus. We start our, our life. We're living life below that line. Then we have this faith relationship with Jesus. Boom, our, our life is up here. We're above the line. And if we would die in that moment, we know that we'd go to heaven. But then how many of you know that even as a Christian, there's real life to live? And so we start living life, and uh, we do something that we probably know we shouldn't have done, and then boom, at least in our mind, boom, we've plunged down beneath this line again, and God doesn't love me, Jesus doesn't love me, and if I died, I'd probably go to hell. So then we find church, and we start giving our money, and we start praying and reading our Bible, and then in our mind, we think, boop, now I'm back up above the line again. And then we make a mistake, boom, down below the line again. And our life is always up and down, up and down. We just live our life that way. And we think as long as my life is above the line, I'm a Christian. When my life is below the line, I'm not a Christian, and God doesn't love me very well. And it ought not to be that way, and I think there's this great confusion about what it is to walk with Jesus Christ. What does an ordinary day in the life of a Christ follower look like? We're, look at, we're gonna look at some scriptures today that would, would help outline that a little bit. And again, I, I think there's confusion even in the church about what it is to be a Christian, what a Christian looks like, because we're confused about what it looks like. Wouldn't it be great that when people looked at you and when people looked at me, they said, you know what, there's something so unique about you. I can see what God has done in your life. There's something so amazing here. I want that. I envy what you have. And if we would all begin to live this heart, this life that was Godward, that started moving upward, that sought more to please God than please ourselves, then people would look at us and they go, you know what, I think I, think, I, think I like what I see. But there's confusion about Christianity because we're confused about it. But if we've really been recreated by God, how will anybody know? And what, what this guy named Paul does for us is he outlines some very clear definitions of what it is to walk with Jesus Christ as to eliminate any confusion in anybody who's watching us live out our faith. Let me give you a little background. If you want to uh, take your Bible, page there, scroll there, turn there. I, I'm in the book of Ephesians. We're going to finish this today. The book of Ephesians. And the, the book of Ephesians is intensely practical. And, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to read a letter that a guy named Paul writes to a church in the city of Ephesus, hence the name Ephesians. This is not a book of the Bible. This is a letter. And he's writing a letter to this newfound church. They're, they're, they've just come out of this old way of living. They've discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul is going to give them some very practical guidelines on how it is to live life. 
Now understand the audience that he's writing to, he's writing to Gentiles, and that's gonna be key in the first verse that we read. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, okay? And, and yet he's gonna make a reference that might seem a little bit confusing. We'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. And so I, I want you to know before we get any further um, that I am an equal opportunity offender. So we're gonna read some things today that are gonna be offensive, all right? Some things that are gonna be uncomfortable, some things that make you mad, some things that you disagree with, but quite simply, all I can say is this, I'm just gonna read scripture and I'll let scripture read you. And that's why sometimes people uh, don't like to read the Bible because there's things in there they don't like to read because they're very uncomfortable. So we're in chapter four of Ephesians and we're gonna start in verse number 17. We're just gonna be really practical. Here's what Paul says in this letter. He's, he's writing to, now again, let, let me just preface by saying this. Paul is writing to people who would profess to be a Christ follower or a Christian. If today you're not a Christian, probably one of the reasons you're not a Christian is because some of the things that we're gonna read about today, you're gonna go, yeah, that's exactly what I have not seen in people who call themselves Christians. And they've left you confused, disillusioned, and with the conclusion, most Christians are just hypocrites. So we're gonna to try to address all that today and say, how should we pattern our life? So Paul says in 17, he says, with the Lord's authority, with the Lord's authority, this letter I'm writing to you, this is not my opinion, these are not my personal convictions. I think I've got a pretty good grip on the person of Jesus Christ and the character of God that what I'm about to say should carry some weight in the way we live. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Are you ready? Live no longer as the Gentiles do. To which the people hearing this letter would be like, wait, 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 wait. I thought we were Gentiles. I mean, because we're not Jews, so we must be Gentiles. So why are you saying don't live like Gentiles? What he's saying is this, there's now not two categories of people, there are three. There are Jews, there are Gentiles, and there are Christ followers. He starts this letter in chapter one, he says, Paul, an apostle called by the Lord himself, write to you, holy people, followers of God, faithful followers of Jesus Christ. That's how he addresses the people in his letter. So he's not, he's not saying, look, I know you're not a Jew, but you're not a Gentile either. Now you're a Christ follower. He says, don't live like the Gentiles do because they're hopelessly confused. That's the world that we live in. When you look at the world that we live in, the world is trying to solve world problems with world solutions, and it's not working. He goes on to say in verse number 18, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life that God has given them because they've closed their minds and they've hardened their hearts against him. In other words, they are very intentional about turning their back on God. They want nothing to do with God. He goes on to say in verse 19, they have no sense of shame, Mom and Dad, let, let, let me just pause right here for a little bit. If you're a parent here today, I feel bad for you because you have to have dialogue and discussion with your children about things that my parents never had to talk to me about because there was things in my generation that were shameful and they were never discussed. There were no sitcoms made about them. There were no articles about them. We didn't have to go online and read about these things. And so Mom and Dad, realizing now, you, you have to deal with things with your students and the world has no shame about those issues. He goes on to talk about these Gentiles or the non-believers. He says, look, they, they live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. And isn't it true that before you accepted Christ as your savior, that's the way you used to live and I used to live? I mean, I've got a story, you've heard my story. That's the way I used to live. Now, I, I want you to understand this. We're not here to bash people who aren't following Jesus Christ. One of the reasons people are so uh, skeptical about the church and they stay away from the church is because the church has been so good at bashing people who are not Christ followers. It's so easy for the church to point out all the problems and all the moral dilemmas of the world outside of the church. It's fun to be inside the church and lob rocks over the walls at people outside the church and tell them all the terrible things that they're doing wrong. But remember, Paul is not addressing primarily people outside the church. He's going to be talking to you and to me because we're inside the church. And that's where the letter is geared to today. He says in verse number 20, look, that's, that's them, but, but that's not what you learned about Jesus Christ, is it? You learned something totally different. He says in verse 21, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old nature and your former ways of life, which were corrupted by lust and deception. He's using this terminology, throw off. It's like you are wearing some old garment, something so distasteful, something nobody would wear. You need to, like it's a Viking's jersey. Just get rid of it, throw it on the ground, wipe your feet on it, like get rid of it. 
And he says, do that with your old life. You used to be a Vikings fan, now you're a, a different fan, all right? So anyway, he's just saying, he, he said that's the way you used to live, but now since you are God's workmanship, remember we talked about that a few weeks ago, if you missed it, it's like God took this canvas and he began to paint on it. You are his masterpiece, his workmanship. And since God has recreated you, live like a recreated person. Throw off that old thing. This is intentional. It's an act of your will. This is something that you and I have complete control over. Verse number 23, he says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Isn't it true that, that when you start following Jesus, um, you hear this little voice in your head. You don't really know what the voice is, but all of a sudden, you become aware of things you were never aware of before. It's like, hmm, I don't think I should be watching this. I don't think I should be reading that. I don't know why, I just feel like I shouldn't, I shouldn't go there anymore. I, I feel like I shouldn't listen to that anymore. Um, Robin and I, we have XM radio in the car, and you know sometimes when you're bored and you're just trying to keep your mind alert, driving down the highway and you start searching through the stations, well, we're, we're 70s era. I mean, we, the whole 70s, so you, you hit channel seven on XM radio and you start listening, and, and we just musically, some of the songs, the whole kind of thing, we start listening to some of the music from the 70s and we look at each other going, do you hear that? They're singing about sex. I didn't know that in high school. I just thought it was about having a good time. Well, obviously, that's what they think too, you know? So then we switch it over to 80s, because boy, they had it together. There was a lot of morality in the 80s, right? You start listening to songs, go, they're singing about sex. I didn't know that when I was listening to those songs. So if we want just really good moral, uplifting, encouraging music, we go to country western. I'm just, no, I'm just, just telling you, they just threw it all out the window there. But there's something inside of you when you're listening to this, watching that, reading that, going to that place, you just go, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't think we should be there. That's the spirit of God working in you to create a new attitude because attitude, attitude, determines, excuse me, your thoughts determine your attitude, and attitude ultimately becomes behavior in your life. Verse 24, he says, you know what, you need to put on your new nature, your new nature. Here's that terminology. You need to put on your new nature. Just wipe your feet on the Vikings jersey, pick up the Green Bay Packers jacket, put it on, and wear it with pride. That's what he said. No, I, I made enemies here. I'm just saying. He says, you need to put on this new nature, this whole new nature, this nature created to be like God. And then if you're saying, but how can I live like God? I mean, there's just, there's no way. That's one of the reasons I stayed away from church. There's no way I could live that kind of life. He says, you need to be righteous and holy, not self-righteous and not holier than thou. You need to be right with God. That's all he's saying. And all of you have holy things in your house. You don't realize it, but you've got holy things. They are things that you have a special place for them. You don't let just anybody handle them. You handle it carefully. You treat it carefully. And the Apostle Paul says, that's the way God looks at you. You're his children. He wants you to be careful with yourself, unstained and undefiled by things around you because he cares about you so much. Well, all of that is kind of theoretical in theory. And so now Paul, as if he knows you and he knows me, he says, you know what, maybe they don't get this whole thing about living righteous and holy, so let, let, let's make this really, really practical so that everybody can understand, all right? So we're going to make it practical. Look at verse number 25. Look, so stop telling lies. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth because we're all part of the same body. The, uh, the inference there is this, that whenever we tell a lie, we hurt everybody. And we lie not just with our mouth, but we lie with our life. Mom and dad, if you're one way at church, and another way at home, and another way at the grocery store, and another way when you're talking to the teacher, your children are looking at you go, wait, 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 mom and dad call themselves a Christian, and yet what I hear mom and dad saying, I'm like, wow. So we lie, it's duplicity. It's being a hypocrite. And, and, and we just lie with our life, we lie with our mouth, and you, I think, can I, I'm not done, I'm just starting stepping on toes here. Do you know where I think we, I think, you know, you know I think a good place to lie? Facebook. Like, I'm just saying, is really your life that great? I wanna see pictures of you when you get out of bed in the morning. Show me those pictures, right? Show me the truth about yourself. Remember this, whatever you post to Facebook, your mama sees it and your pastor sees it. Just saying, all right? So I have a feeling, honey, we're going to get unfriended by a whole bunch of people uh, later today. 
And then he says in verse 26, he says, look, and, and, don't, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Anger is a natural emotion. We all get angry. This last week I heard some news about a marriage. It made me, it made me angry. I cried. I wept out of anger. It's called righteous anger. But there's this anger that you and I can possess primarily, do you know why? Because <laughs> we didn't get our way. I don't care if you're 2, 52, or 92. When you don't get your way, you can get angry. And then you know what happens with anger? We, we, start, we, we let the sun go down while we're still angry. We lay in bed at night. We think about it. We replay the conversation over and over ahead. Well, he said and she said, and you know what? If I saw that again, this is what I would say. This is what I would tell them. This is, and you know what? I'm going to get up. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm still mad about this, and I'm going I'm to type out my rant on Facebook and hit send. There, ooh, I said it. Ooh, I feel good now, you know? And when we do that, Paul says, look, you're giving the devil a foothold because anger can turn into bitterness, which can turn into resentment, which turns into unforgiveness, which turns into a divided relationship. Primarily divided from God. All right, so, offended anybody yet? We're not done. <laughs> We've got a ways to go. Look, verse 28, he says, if you're a thief, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Stop it. He says, just instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. There can be this tendency inside of you and me to just steal. We can steal from our employers. If you're an employer today, you know that you're getting ripped off by employees. If not the product, it's time. We steal all the time. And Paul says, stop it. That's not the way Christ followers should live. We don't hold anger. We don't hold grudges. We don't tell lies, and we don't steal things. It's pretty simple. Verse 29, don't use foul and abusive language. Let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. You know what? As I read about Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus hung out with sinners. And I love the way the Bible writers put that, sinners. They were the people the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with. Because the Pharisees thought they were so much better than those people. But Jesus went and had supper with them a lot. And in that culture, whenever you had a meal with somebody, it was as if, it was if to, you were saying, I, I accept you right where you are and I approve of the way you live. Jesus loves us unconditionally. Do you understand that? But that doesn't mean that he wants us to stay where we are all the time. And so Jesus would hang out with sinners. Now, when he's hanging out with sinners and have supper with them, do you think Jesus ever heard dirty stories and, and uh, bad language? I bet they did. I bet, I bet he did. I, I tell you what, I, I've never heard, I used to work in a bar, I used to work in a bar, I heard a lot of foul language in a bar. I mean, because that's where you use foul language. In a bar, people know how to use the F word as a pronoun, an adjective, a verb, a verb modifier. I mean, they just know how to use those words, right? And then when I got saved, I just kind of really got separated from that whole thing. And then I come back here to Williston, got in the ministry. And I just love it. I love it. One, one service, one service. I, I'm going to tell the story. Maybe I shouldn't tell the story. This is a few years back. Somebody came here. They found Jesus Christ, got so excited. And they were just giving me, a, right back there, right back there by that door. They're going, oh, man, church was so effing good. I just effing love what you said. And they're just going on and on and on. They just accepted Jesus that day. I had no greater expectations for them. But when a born-again believer is using those words, there was a great mentor in this church years ago. He's, he's, um, he passed away years ago. His name was Marvin. You'll hear me talk about Marvin from time to time. Just a great spiritual mentor. And, and one of the things that, that cleaned up really, really fast in my life when I came to faith in Jesus was my language. I mean, I, I had horrible language before that. Uh, as a youth pastor, I remember talking to one of the kids here. don't even remember who it was. And they were cussing up a storm. And I said, do you have to talk that way? I can't help it. I said, well, do you swear in front of your parents? Oh, no, they'd kill me. Oh, so you can help it. Okay. <laughs> and and I, remember, I remember being at Marvin's one night. We were over there just probably eating, just having a nice time. And he says, uh, he says Chris, do you know what a euphemism is? No, I, I don't think I do. It's like a musical instrument. I don't know. You know? So he, he gets out the big Oxford dictionary and he opens up the Oxford euphemism. A lesser term for a harsher word. He says, Chris, we don't say somebody's dead. We say they passed away. It's like, oh, okay, I understand. And he says, um, look up the word darn. Okay, so turn pages back and 
darn, euphemism for, don't say it. He says, look up the word gosh. What do you think gosh is a euphemism for? God. Oh, you're right. And then, and then lately, just in the, the recent years, there's another euphemism that has been introduced, and I hear, I hear Christ followers use it, and it kind of grieves my heart a little bit. And it's a euphemism for the F word. I think, oh, come on. And, and Marvin, in his gentle way, just because I think, I think what Marvin heard sometimes in my vocabulary was gosh and darn and dang. And in Marvin's very gentle, loving way, pointed out to me that maybe I should change that a little bit. I have complete control over my tongue, just like you do. I told you we're going to be practical. Anybody offended yet? Raise your hand. Okay, just, we're good, we're good. Verse 30, and don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Like, if, if there's something that I haven't mentioned here, let me just paint your life with a broad brush here. Don't bring sorrow to God's, or your, verse, your version might say, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Look, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you'll be saved on the day of redemption. Simply put, here's what I think. I think Paul is saying this. I think, Lord, there, there's sometimes when we might in our minds think that our life has dropped below that line. We're still above the line in God's eyes. If we were to die in a car accident at that moment, I think we'd still get to heaven. But the reality is we've, we've said something or done something that uh, I, I, think, I think our father's just kind of disappointed in us. If you're a parent, you've been disappointed with your children. You probably disappointed your parents, and that probably hurt worse than anything, didn't it? Somebody that you loved, admired, respected so much, and you disappointed them. Paul says, look, don't do that with your heavenly father. He still loves you. You're still going to go to heaven. It's not an issue of saved, unsaved, Christian, not Christian. It's just that you're living in such a way that right now God's just like, oh, come on. Come on, really? He, he continues on with this line of thought. Next chapter, verse number one. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his dear, dear children. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm supposed to imitate God? Well, that should be the goal. That should be the desire for all of us. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if, um, well, you've heard the term, you've heard this term before when you've watched somebody's kids and you, we've all used this statement or maybe heard it before. Boy, the apple don't fall far from the tree. You ever heard that before? And we can use it in a good way or a negative way, either way, that whole thing. Wouldn't it be great if we who call ourselves Christ followers would go to the workplace, would go to the school, go to the classroom, go out in the community, and people would look at the way we live, and they go, I think they must be a Christian, because you know what? The apple don't fall far off the tree. That when they see us, they should see God. And ultimately, what can help us live that way is, in, in, and I just made this up. You're going to love me. I'm going to be brilliant. I'm going to make a whole bunch of money marketing this. When we're given any situation, we should ask ourselves this question. Are you ready? What would Jesus do? I'm going to make bracelets. I'm going to make, we're just going to have, we're going to market that thing, WWJD. Do you think it'll catch on? I just made it up. Verse 3, verse 3, verse 3. Let there, be, let there be no sexual immorality. You know what I've learned? Even after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, your hormones work just as good after being a Christian as they do before. Impurity, greed, such sins have no place amongst God's people. In other words, just stop it. But I got hormones, I can't control You can control it. You've got complete control over your body. Verse 4, obscene stories, foolish, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These, are, they're not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. I, I don't think I need to really elaborate on any of that a little bit. It's pretty self-explanatory. I love what Psalm 141, verse number 3 says. This is a, a prayer that David prayed, and I think it would be a great prayer for us to pray before our feet touch the floor in the morning. He prayed this prayer. Set a watch over my lips and a guard over my tongue. How many know that's a good prayer, right? In other words, help me not to say something stupid and put my foot in my mouth today. I love just the practicality of Scripture. Verse 5, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. And he's talking to Christians here. Because thoughts turn into attitudes and attitudes turn into behavior. Verse 6, this is, this is very interesting to me. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these things. 
You know, there's people in the church, people who would profess to be a Christ follower that will, in some way, shape, or form, try to justify their behavior that is anti-scriptural. Well, I think when the Bible says this, what it's really saying is this. If you have to justify your behavior, your behavior is probably unjustifiable. And as people within the church that are going to try to convince other people that a little bit won't hurt, you can do it, it's not that bad, oh come on, we're a mature Christian, we've gotten to the place, we understand it, it's not going to hurt you, it's not going to harm you, just come on, and they're going to try to excuse these things, and there's going to be this little check in your spirit, listen to the check and shut them off. It's just the reality. When you read about Bible, when, when, when Peter and Paul, this isn't my notes, you're gonna get a free sermon here. When Peter and Paul and other Bible writers warn against, uh, uh, against false teachers and heresies in the church, he doesn't, they don't talk about the government. They don't, they don't talk about the government. They don't talk about leader. You know what they talk about? They talk about people from the church. That the greatest deception, the greatest danger areas are people within the church. Cults don't start from our national government. Our president and our governor and our legislators are not beginning a cult. Do you know where cults start? They start from people inside the church. That's where they come from. Verses 7 and 8, don't, don't, don't participate in these things that people do because once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord, so just live like people of light. Live differently. You say, all right, pastor, that's great, that's, that's great. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Paul answers the question for us in verse number 10. Look what he says in verse number 10. He says, look, just carefully determine what pleases the Lord. <laughs> this, is not, this is not some deep theological thing that you've got to wrap your mind around. Just carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Think about this. What if, what, if, what, if you, what if you looked at all the finances that pass through your hands and you carefully determined what pleases the Lord with your finances? Do you think you'd be better off financially? What if you carefully determined um, how you manage relationships and what kind of relationships, what kind of guy you date, what kind of girl you date, what you do when you're on the date? What if you carefully determined what pleases God while you're on the date? It would probably lead to less regrets on the next morning, wouldn't it? What if we carefully determined what pleases the Lord with our morals and with our ethics and how we conducted our life and our speech? We'd probably have a lot less problems in our life, wouldn't we? I mean, it's just so intensely practical. Now, what if everybody who calls themselves a Christ follower would live their life in such a way that they were carefully determining what pleases the Lord? I'm, I'm, th I'm, I'm just imagining, I'm just imagining if, if everybody who called themselves a Christ follower really lived their life that way, the world around us would go, you know what? I want what you have. How come in the midst of turmoil, you have such peace. How, how, how is it that even though in the midst of financial crisis, you're still cool with things and you put your trust in God? How is it that, that when you should just, man, if, if I were you, I would just rip into them for the way they betrayed you. You can, you can still just be cool. I think God made such an investment in us, and that's really the way the beginning of this book starts out. God made an investment in you and in me, a gracious investment. Long before we even had a thought about serving God or loving God or doing anything that was pleasing to God, God reached out towards us. It was love that moved him and motivated him, love that motivates us to invest in him. Because Jesus died to change me, I'm dying to live a life of change. Because I love him, I owe him so much, I just want to do it. You understand this concept when you're married, if you're married today, I'll bet you when you got married, after a period of time, some of your habits changed because the person that you married said something and you love them so much, you were willing to change. You no longer hang your dirty underwear on the doorknob. You take it off and put it in the dirty clothes. Praise God for that. Because you love that person so much, you'll do that. When you were single, nobody cared. But now there's somebody that cares about you and you care about them, so you'll change some things in your life. If we just determined what pleased God and then lived that way, do you think it would change our lives for the better or for the worse? Now, now, that can't be the motivation for living a life of change. That can't be the motivation for living a life of change. 
Do you know why I'm going to live a changed life? Do you know why I'm going to live differently? It's not a performance. It's not because I'm in a fishbowl. It's not because, yes, the expectations and demands of a believer are higher than other people and other standards in the world. I'm not going to do it for that. Do you know why I'm going to do it? Because I love God. My soul and your soul was dangling over the cauldron of hell and the flames came up singeing us before we said yes to Jesus. And somewhere along the line in God's grace, he reached out to us and snatched us from across the flames. He set our feet on a solid place. He gave us hope. We become his workmanship, his masterpiece. He recreated us, and he did everything for us. We owe him everything, and he owed us nothing. What can I give him in return but my life? I don't live a life, oh, bummer, I can't steal something today because I'm a Christian. Oh, I better not tell that joke or that story today because I'm a Christian. I better not live sexually immoral because I'm a Christian. Boy, God is such a fun sucker. Do you know why I'm going to live upright? Because I love Jesus. Jesus. 